it is absolutely an honor and a privilege to introduce to you Ernie Johnson Jr. That was supposed to be the walk-up music. <laughs> That's quite all right. I'll, I'll explain that to you in just a second. Uh, thanks for uh, being here this morning. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you. Uh, one thing that I uh, never assume is that uh, you know who I am or what I do. Because not everybody has to be a sports fan. All right? Uh, and so now that that's out in the open, it's all good. Uh, but by way of introduction, if you're not an NBA fan, if you don't watch me with Shaq and Kenny and Chuck, we talk basketball. And um, from time to time, kind of stray from what you might think of as a typical halftime show. Because uh, sometimes this happens.
So, mid 60s, 1960s. In the, in the middle row, kind of hunched down, that's me playing for a team at Murphy Candler Park uh, over in Dunwoody, uh, playing for a team called the V's. Uh, when I'm eight, going on nine. Uh, I don't know what the deal was with the team name. It didn't exactly strike fear into the hearts of anyone. We're going to play with V's today, you know. I don't, I don't think the L's and the X's were just you know, running from the field. But, so here's what happened one day when I played for the V's. A ground rule double, for those of you who may not be baseball fans, is a ball that's hit over the fence on a hop. Automatically, you give the guy second base. So what happens one day is the other team gets a ground rule double, and before we can start the game again, we have to go find our left fielder and our center fielder because they have scaled that fence at Murphy Candler Park in search of the baseball. We ran out to the fence. We could see the baseball. <laughs> 15 feet away are the left fielder and the center fielder eating blackberries. <laughs> All right? This is it's a true story and one that we found amusing when it happened. My dad, being a former Major League Baseball player, thought that was the funniest thing in the world. I've never heard of a blackberry delay, but it happened. And, but it wasn't just something that happened that day. Because as I grew older and hopefully wiser, it became kind of like a modern day parable for me. Because what these kids had done is they had stepped away from the game for a moment. Even though, maybe, you know, mom and dad may have said, hey, you know, this is it's a big game against the M's this week. You know, I want you to focus. I want you to be, I want your head in there. It's this important. No. They had, they had seen this opportunity in the middle of the game to say, man, blackberries, let's dive in. And that modern day parable was, was yet yeah, look, don't get so tied up in the game, whatever that game might be. And I know there are a lot of responsibilities and there's lots of, look, there are meetings and there are conference calls and there, I mean, your responsibilities are immense. But don't miss those sweet moments, those unpredictable moments that can make your life extraordinary. Those are what I call Blackberry moments. And you all are sitting in seats right now where you're going to have an opportunity to spread those Blackberries to so many kids and to, and to co-workers alike by making their day. It's a true story. A couple of years ago, and for the guys in here, I'm not saying this to to guilt anybody here or make anybody like oh, feel bad. So I buy my wife flowers all the time. Doesn't, doesn't have to be for a special occasion. Just has to be because I want to stay married to, to Cheryl. <laughs> so when I'm in Publix or something, I'm always buying flowers. You know. And one day I bought two bouquets. I don't know what I had done that week that was particularly egregious that I felt like I better buy two, but I bought two. So I'm putting my stuff in my car, and I, and I look in the parking lot in one of the handicap spots, and there's this elderly woman who's kind of struggling to put her stuff away. And sometimes, and not if you agree, sometimes you get a little nudge little tap on the shoulder, one of those little like prompts that says, hey, you got two of those, share one. So I, I, I take this, put my stuff in, grab one of the, the extra, okay, walk over and I said, look, you are, I have no really reason for doing this and uh, I don't want to make it uncomfortable, but I want you to have these. And you know what this woman said? I lost my husband a year ago today, and nobody's got me flowers since.
That's not some made up story. I watched that stuff happen. You don't think that was a Blackberry moment for that woman that day? And see, it's, and what it requires is stepping away from your game for a second. I could have been, look, go to the store, get this stuff, get back, got things to do, got me, 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 I gotta do this, I gotta do this. When you step away, when you look around, and the only way you can do that is, I mean, you gotta look. You gotta see these opportunities. You can't, can't be buried your phone. You can't be checking your timeline. Ooh, I got another like. Oh, oh, I missed that. No. You got to be aware. You got to have the eyes to see it, the ears to hear it, the heart to feel it. And you can make these things happen. They're Blackberry moments. And my, look, my childhood was filled with them. That's my dad, Bernie Johnson Sr. Um, as I say when I, when I show this picture, it's, it's, it's the man I always looked up to. And, and I was like two or three years old at that point. It was, he was near the end of his career. Um, but growing up, as a, as a you know, a baseball fan, and, and, you know, he became a Braves broadcaster for years and years and years. And uh, got to work with him. And you talk about it. You talk about your Blackberry moments when you're sitting there with your old man calling baseball back in the 90s. It's, it's what I call a get-to job. Not a got-to job. It's a get-to job. As you sit here today, how many of you are saying, you know what? Starting next week, again, my get-to job. Not my got-to job. We all know the difference. You can see it in the face of the person who's in the car next to you when it's 7.15 in the morning and you're driving to work and you look and you're stopped at a light and you look at, at the other driver and it's like gotta go to work gotta go to work in the meantime you are in your car saying I get to I get to go to, I get to do this job I get to be in the midst of this this process of where Kids are coming to school and you're shaping them and you're helping to form their development. And you've chosen that and you get to do it. Sure, there was some, oh, I've got to do this because that's, yeah, but overall, is it not a get to job? If it's not, You can make it that way. It's all about your approach. Okay, this this woman in the picture here. This is uh, this is uh, Cheryl, uh, and that's me. Long before Tiger Woods, I was doing the fist bump because uh, I was amazed that she had even said yes at some point. Was, there's my dad, who's my best man in the back, and, and so uh, I, I met Cheryl Ann down in Macon, Georgia. Anybody? been to Macon, from Macon, yeah, very good. So my first TV job, I was anchor of the news in Macon, Georgia. And, uh, and there was this woman working her way through, co uh, through college down at Mercer University. Uh, she's working for a psychiatrist, and she's also the teller at the drive through window at the bank where I, where I go out uh, on every Friday to deposit a measly check from Channel 13 and make it my first job, anchor of the news, not getting paid anything, but still a get-to job because that's what I studied, that's what I want to do. But so Cheryl always says we met through six inches of bulletproof glass. <laughs> and, and you know sometimes you know, she, she would look at my check. The first time I, I did that, she was like, um, so what do you do at WMAZ? I said, well, 
Well, I anchor the news. <laughs> 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 Look, I'm in school, I'm working two jobs, I don't have time to watch. Sometimes it's good to be humble. Sometimes when you start thinking you're all that, it's good to have somebody bring you back to reality. So I got no idea who you are, except you make no money and you work at Channel 13. But, but somehow it all worked. Somehow it, it, it all worked, and, and a few years later, uh, we were married, and, uh, and it'll be 40, if we make it to, if we make it to August 21st, it'll be 41 years. Um, I get to There's probably a few more flowers that need to be need to be brought home from the public. Uh, and so now we and we've had this we've raised this family. Okay, so back row on the left is Eric, my oldest, and then uh, standing in the yellow sweater is Maggie, who's the Buford High School teacher now. Uh, so we have these two kids. And then, and then we adopt four. The little boy in the chair, the girl in the middle, so Michael's from Romania, Carmen's from Paraguay, and then when Cheryl and I were in our 50s, we adopted Ashley and Allison uh, from foster care in uh, Cleveland, um, which was, I know what you're thinking. You know, so you're in your 50s and then you adopt two more. Yeah, we did. And, and, and yes, we're out of our minds. So, um, so that's the family, uh, and that's kind of like the walk-up music, which you heard just a beat of from Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors is, is our favorite is our favorite song, or one of our favorites, Family. We love that song. And so what, I'm, what I want to tell you about, as this goes into Blackberry moments, is, is the story of the kid in the wheelchair. Uh, because he was born in Romania. And my wife and I, have you ever feel like you're you're living out the script the way things are supposed to be? Like here, Cheryl and I are married. Uh, we've got great jobs. We've got two great kids, a boy and a girl. And the script is just right there. You know, let's not rock the boat. Let's not do anything different. Let's just, let's just maintain this. And I come home one day from, uh, from work. And Cheryl says, you know what we need to do tonight? And, and, and I, I was like, chicken or fish, you know, <laughs> whatever, it's fine. She said, no, you know what we need to do? We need, we need to go to Romania and adopt a baby. <laughs> and I said, no, chicken or fish, really, it's fine. And, 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 and then I get this story from her where she says, I was watching ABC News, I was watching 2020. They do this big story about what's going on in Romania. They had a revolution over there. They got all these kids who are unwanted. They've got these kids with special needs. They've been put in these orphanages and forgotten. And I think we need to get one. Okay, let's. I'm open to discuss this. And we go to a couple of meetings with people who have been there and done that. And then we decide to go unscripted. We decide that there's probably a Blackberry moment or two in this. There's probably an opportunity to give somebody a second chance where we hadn't even thought about it. So, Cheryl goes to Romania. And it's not like she went and we had like, here's, a, here's some paperwork. Here's the child in Bucharest we're supposed to pick up and bring home. This will probably take a couple of days and we'll be out of there. Now, this is a two-month proposition. We had no idea who she's going to be. But through, through all of our uh, home studies and that kind of thing, and all the paperwork you have to do if you're going to adopt, maybe some of you have been through this process, uh, we said, you know, if we can adopt a little girl under a year old, no permanent handicaps, kind of, you know, give her a second chance, that'd be great. Um, so Cheryl goes to this orphanage, and this is the first kid they bring out. It's not a little girl under a year old. By the way, Cheryl. When, I, when we talk about this picture, she has mixed feelings. She 
loves it because it's one of the first times she's held this little boy. She hates it because she was having a bad hair year. <laughs> But that's beside the point. But here's the point. The nurse who handed this little boy to my wife, you know what, you know what she said to her? She said, don't take this boy, he's no good. He had some issues. Abandoned in a park after his birth. Hadn't been outside since that day. He's in that orphanage. He couldn't walk, couldn't talk. Just made noises. Had the developmental delays, had all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> One foot totally turned in. So my wife calls me from Bucharest. And this is back in 91. It's not everybody would walk around with cells. You know, some there were, there were days that went by when we wouldn't talk. And she tells me all about this kid and, and says, he is so much more than we can handle, but I can't imagine going the rest of my life wondering what happened to him. So how do you unpack that on the other end of the phone? something that in her voice, it's something from her heart that you can detect over thousands of miles over a scratchy phone line, and I said, well, bring him home. And there we embarked on this unscripted part of the story. Because we got him home, and it was like, you know, take him to the doctor. And he said, look, look, while you got the hood up, let's check this and this and this and this. So they took care of his foot. You know, they casted that. But they came back one day and they said, look, we've, we've run a bunch of tests and we got, this is not easy to tell you, but he's got muscular dystrophy. And, uh, and there's no cure for that. And a lot of kids don't make it out of their teens. And that's sobering news as a parent. You know what's funny too? We have friends of ours when we're dealing with this diagnosis who said, wow, that's, that's so sad. <clears throat> Guess if you'd known that, you wouldn't have done it. I said, no, you don't get it. Because there's no guarantee. Like, we have Eric and Maggie, all right? There's no guarantee that our biological kids, that something, that something might happen someday that's catastrophic, that changes everybody's life, and it's not like I said, man, I knew we shouldn't have had that kid. No, this is our, this is our adopted son. This is our son. This is a brother, and, this is a brother to Maggie and Eric. No, we're, we, will, we will deal with this, and we will get through this. And this is... And this is a chapter, an unscripted chapter. And let's see where it takes us. And, and so I know you may be sitting there and say, okay, Mr. Blackberry moments. Hey, look at these great moments that happened. Hey, how about, where are they? They're out there. Sometimes you got to look. Sometimes you need a guy like this in your life. Sometimes you need the guy in the blazer with the hairline similar to mine <laughs> is Phil Bolier. Phil was a basketball coach in Indiana, basketball crazy Indiana, who moved down south to football crazy Georgia to work at this brand new mega high school, sprawling Mill Creek High School just opening its doors, and he's going to be the first head basketball coach there. And uh, I get a note from Phil one day, and I, 
I never met the guy. Get a note from Michael's backpack. Michael's been in a wheelchair now for since he was trussed, so, you know, for five years or so. Totally, you know, begin losing the ability to walk or to balance or any of any of that. And it says, uh, Mr. Johnson, haven't haven't met you, but I want your son on my basketball team. See, here's what you got to remember about Phil Bollier. Phil Bollier sees value. And for every one of you in this room, look for the value. Look for what, look for what can be done by individuals, not what they can't do. See the value. Because, because Phil says, I said, I'd be happy to sit and talk with you about your plan for Michael. And he says, I know with whatever strength he has, it's all he can do to you know, drive the chair around. He said, but when I met him the other day, and, and Michael's a special kid. I mean, he had kind of a, like a Rain Man mentality. And memory, and he and he just obsessed about cars, and lawnmowers, and vacuum cleaners. Look, there was a lot of stuff. I don't know what happened in Romania in those first three years, but he's okay. Look, he had some baggage that we were unpacking. So uh, he would always quiz you about your car. He kind of couldn't speak. Didn't speak till he was eight, and then he wouldn't shut up. But, <laughs> He was just fascinated with cars. And he couldn't read or write. But if you got him a car brochure from a dealership and you sat down and said, that's that's a Toyota Avalon, that's this, you know, is that me doing that? Okay. Oh, or maybe it just means I just had an idea. Um, <laughs> but he you would tell him what these are as you look through them, and then it would it, he just cataloged it. So he knew every car, make and model. You know, we'd be, we'd be driving on vacation somewhere. He'd be sitting in his wheelchair in the, in the back. And for six hours, he would name every car. That's a delightful trip. <laughs> Daddy, Chevrolet Astro Van. That's a good one, Michael. So, uh, well, we love that too. It was that kind of stuff for six hours. It was just splendid. It really was. But so he quizzes Bolier about his car as he meets him by chance in a special needs classroom at Mill Creek High School. And then Phil turns to leave and Michael hits him with, love you too, coach. And Phil hadn't said, hey, Michael, I love you. I'm out of here. No, Michael. He just walked out and Michael said, love you too, coach, and, and that kind of stopped the coach in his tracks. And then, and, and so the coach said, not, not only do I want him to teach my team uh, maximum effort, I want, it, I want him to teach them a heart for others. He says, because that love you too thing really hit me. I said, oh, coach, he's yours. Do, if he doesn't care about basketball, he, and he could not care less if you win or lose. Michael was all about hanging in the locker room, finding out what the kids drove. <laughs> it was like one of the big kids fouled out one day, came back, threw his towel down, threw himself down on the bench. Michael sitting behind the bench and Spencer drives a Suzu Rodeo. <laughs> it was awesome. So uh, here's where Phil Bolier steps away from the game. while he's teaching and coaching. He would sometimes take five minutes out of the class in his trailer at Mill Creek High School and tell the students, hey, I'm going to tell you about a buddy of mine named Michael Jones. I was going to tell you, born in Romania, and he tells them the story. He says, and I know you students, you like to use sign language. You like to walk the halls, and a lot of times that sign language is usually one finger. <laughs> So you're better. <laughs> he said, well, let me teach you something new. He says, 
Because what my buddy Michael likes to do is say, uh, is, likes to say, love you too. Yes, and so in sign language, that's I love you. Yes, I love you. And if you point your index finger at the other person, it means love you too. So Phil Bolier is teaching his classes. He's coaching basketball, and he's teaching his students, love you too. Phil has stepped away from the game. Phil hasn't been so concerned with, here's what I have to do today. I know I got this lesson, I got this. But here's an opportunity. Here's five minutes that I want to share with these kids. So on senior night, a few years later, all the seniors are going out and, and they're getting the blanket that has the Mill Creek logo. It's embroidered on there, got their name on there. Folks are cheering, you know, here are the seniors, boom, blah, blah, blah. And, and the last guy they, guy they introduce is Mike. Drives his wheelchair up there to center court. Cheryl and I are with him. And, uh, and they put the blanket on him. And, uh, While the folks are cheering, I look up in the student section and they're standing like this. <clears throat> Don't take this boy, he's no good. Hands that kid. There's value. May not always be readily apparent. But it's there. Find it. Look for it. Be curious. Ted Lasso is one of my favorite shows. <laughs> Be curious, not judgmental. Be curious. Where's this student come from? What's this student going through? No, not this. You know, you may have had students in the past where you thought, this kid's no good. You wouldn't verbalize that. But you see, man, this guy's trouble. Be curious. And then be there to see the value. To plant another blackberry. I mean, it was, it was an amazing thing to watch. To see this basketball team join their hands on his lap and say, one, two, three, hawks, and take the floor. Don't take this kid, he's no good. And one of the greatest things about it, one of the greatest things about that experience, it, you know the, the guy I talked about who broke the Isuzu Rodeo, who followed out of that game? About 10 years later, he graduates. I get a phone call from him. And he says, Mr. Johnson, I'm getting married. This great kid. And he's like, wow, that's awesome. And, uh, and I thought, oh, here comes an invitation to the wedding. He said, can Michael be at my way? <laughs> Don't take this boy. He's no good. No, no, he's no good. He only helped transform a high school. turning this into Sunrise Sermonette, but only God does this. Only God takes a basketball coach from Indiana and an orphan from Romania and puts, puts them in a gym in Brazelton, Georgia and teaches a high school about love. I can't, I can't script that. I can't say, hey, this will this will work. No. But for him it's like, oh, this is cake. I got no, I've got the pieces. I'll move him here, him here, him here. And you watch what can happen. If you're looking for value. Anybody in here, and this is a stupid question, but I'm good at that. <laughs> Anybody have their life impacted by cancer in any way? Could be you, could be a friend, could be a family member, a colleague. Yeah, it's not easy. So where are the Blackberry moments when you're going through that? 
did. Dr. Emery sit across the table from me in 2003 and tell me I had cancer, had non Hodgkin's lymphoma. 2019, 2018, I had a doctor sit across the table from me and tell me I had prostate cancer. So I've been down the road. You know where the Blackberry moments are? It's when you hit the send button. It's when you hit the send button. Not me, the guy who's hooked up to the chemo machine. But it's you. It's your friends. It's your family. It's your colleagues. Who realize what you're going through and then step away from their game long enough to say, pray for you, think about you. We'll look for you. Send. Think about it right now. Who in your life right now is going through some stuff? Doesn't have to be cancer. Could be a marriage that's crumbling. Could be trouble with a kid. Could be in-law who's sick. Could be a colleague whose wife is sick. <laughs> Got somebody in mind? Got somebody who's struggling? Are you like me a lot of times when you say, I really need to reach out and make sure everything's okay. I really need to do that. And then you never do that. And then you keep on saying, oh yeah, I need to do that. Do that, please. And, and look, I know it's always polite, and it's kind of like, hey, when you're in here and now we're, we're speaking, hey, turn your cell phone off. And do it. I do. I wouldn't care if I just brought to mind somebody for you. I wouldn't care right now if you if you turned your phone off and you said, I'm going to take care of this right now. I'm, I'm going to stop saying, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get around to that. Be intentional about it. Those are where the Blackberry moments come from. That's where when you're when you're going through something like this and you're having a bad day where just one message, just one phone call, just knowing there's somebody out there who's praying for you, thinking about you, pulling for you, provides a huge Blackberry for you. Be intentional about that. You're going to think that all I have at my house are, are pictures of Little League games. <laughs> it's like, uh, there, there's, there's this whole room at this house in Brazelton that's just, oh, no, that's in the Little League pictures room. No, but this is, this is two years after the Blackberries. This is in Sandy Springs. Um, and for some reason, we had ends on our hands there for national. Like we had a national American League. But now... I'm playing for the Big Apple Tigers, uh, which is a much more ferocious name. It struck fear through the hearts of, uh, of all the people in Sandy Springs Little League. And I'm on the far side next to the coach. There's Roger Thompson. See, as we can all use some Phil Bolier in our lives, we can all use some Roger Thompson in our lives, too. Because Roger was the coach. Uh, football fans, football historians, the name Bart Starr ring a bell to you. Green Bay Packers, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. One out of 600. <laughs> <laughs> three out of 600. No, three, three and a half. Out of, uh, four. <laughs> um, so, he's buddies with Bart Starr. And we, the Big Apple Tigers, were in the championship game in 1967. And what does Roger Thompson do in the dugout before the first pitch against, against Western Electric? <laughs> that I remember that we played Western Electric for the championship that year. It's ridiculous. So uh, he he pulls out of his pocket a telegram. See, a telegram is a piece of paper. <laughs> and, and you, could, if it, if you could type a message to somebody, and it would show up. So it's like it's like a hard copy of a text. That's the best I can do. It's a telegram. There will be a quiz after this. What was that thing he talked about that has a message? It's a telegram. So, so he pulls out this telegram, and it's from Bart Starr. 
And we thought, this is the coolest thing. Roger Thompson knows Bart Starr. Bart Starr saying, hey, we just won the Super Bowl this year. We're pulling for the Big Apple Tigers to be champions, too. We went out and thrashed Western <laughs> Lake. Close. And so, so, Roger Thompson was special. He helped the 10-year-old kid kind of get through this 10, 11, and 12-year-old league I'm playing in. And that's not the puff of my chest because I was 10 playing with a 12 year old. I was pretty good. But anyway, so, so um, I stayed in touch with Roger Thompson through the years. And we won that championship in 1967. And we would still talk by phone. He was living in North Carolina. I'd call him. We'd go over details of games that were played 40, 50 years ago. It was awesome. And, and uh, when we won the championship, we, we had an end of year party. And I know for y'all, end of year parties after, at the end of baseball seasons usually involve a lot of stuff. You know, okay, who on the team has a pool? You know, who, are we going to go here? Who's going to order the food? You know. So, you know what our end of the season gift was? Here I'm a 10 year old, so we're 10, 11, and 12. The gift that he that he presented to each of us. What do you think we want when you're 10, 11, and 12? A pen. Yeah, that's not it. <laughs> that's what we got. He gave us a pen. And on that pen were written three words. Dedication, pride, and togetherness. Dedication, pride, and togetherness. I never forgot that. Because what he did was he just ingrained that in us. And they were values that would carry you through life. That carry you even into this very room right now. Think about the values of dedication to your profession. Pride in doing that. And the togetherness. Look, you're, this is Hall County. Your family here. You've all got the same goal. You're going to try to reach them in different ways. But dedication, pride, and togetherness. It's amazing how that works. To me, it's amazing how messages get across to you. Some, they don't have to be verbalized all the time. You can just, you just watch somebody. You watch how they handle different situations. I always, I like to tell parents, I said, remember this about kids, and you can remember this about students. They have superpowers. They see and hear everything. They see and hear everything. You hear a lot about influencers these days, right? And paying people, to, people get paid to tell you what to drive, what to eat, what to wear, how to smell, and everything else. The best influencers of my life were my dad, my coach, my teachers. And I would encourage you to do this. And I'm not trying to give you a bunch of homework, like, you know, reach out to somebody who's struggling. Drop a blackberry on. But you know how easy it is these days to catch up with somebody you haven't seen in forever. Sometimes you don't want them, you know, oh, how did that person find me on Facebook? <laughs> oh, how did that happen? But think about it. Who's the teacher? Who's the neighbor? Who's the coach? Who's the influencer in your life? who would really benefit from a call from their old sixth grade student say, thank you. Thank you for teaching me. That's, to me, that's kind of the vibe with Roger Thompson. It was my way of always being able to reach out and say, thank you for investing in me. Thanks for feeling like I was that important. Who is that for you? Who is it you could reach out to? And you've said, you know, I wonder what they're up to. I'd like to reach out. If that's for me, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs>
But who is that person? I would challenge you. Think of that person. Reach out. Reconnect. Say thanks. See, I tried to drop a I tried to drop a Blackberry moment on Roger Thompson. Show up at his door one day a few years ago. Living in North Carolina, I'm up there in the mountains picking up my daughters from a camp, and I said, "We have a stop to make on the way home. I'll explain it to you later." And I stop at this house outside Asheville and knock on the door. And Roger Thompson and his wife come to the door, and they say, "Ernie." And I was like, I just had to come by and see you again and say thanks again. We gotta head home, but I just wanna hang with you for a couple minutes. Roger Thompson gets Blackberry moments. Because you know what he did? He says, hey, come downstairs to the TV room for a second. So we go down there, and I'm sitting there, and he disappears. And he comes back like three minutes later with the championship trophy from 1967. <laughs> Take this home with you. How good is that? How, how rich are moments like that? Out of the blue, you can do it too. You're in a position to do that. You're in a position to make somebody's day right out of the blue. Closing up just with legacy. I know they gave me two hours, but I'm not going to eat up two hours. <laughs> So what is it you want to leave? It is so gratifying for me to see a family that embraces Blackberry moments. So I'll get emojis and stuff from, or just, you know, my daughter will be out with the kids and say, that's a Blackberry day. We did this and this and this. And, and so, for me, like, the picture on the right, me as a first time father with my dad, Firstborn son Eric. And so and so when Eric becomes a dad, and I'm over at his place, and he says, Hey Poppy, which is the, what the grandkids call. Hey Poppy, sit down in a chair over here. I'm gonna I'm gonna hand Everett to you. I need you I need his head on your on your left arm. And I'm just gonna lean in over here and Quinn take a picture, boom, and then and then on Father's Day, this shows up. feels quite as good as seeing somebody get it. And you see those breakthroughs too when you're in the classroom, don't you? Suddenly, you know, after, wow, he gets it. She gets it. it has something to do with that. And so, all we're trying to do Cheryl Ann and I, as we as we continue to raise our kids, um, and we relish these five grandchildren, and we and we trust God. Period. Okay, that, that came from my cancer battles. Not trust God if this next test goes back the way I want it to. I'll trust God when I'm done with this. Not trust God. Period. He's taking me someplace I need to be. I may not see it, but I'm going through some of these trials because this is going to form me, it's going to shape me. It's going to prepare me for the day when I lose Michael when he was, he was 33 a year and a half ago when he lost him. Wasn't supposed to make it out of his teams, lived 33 years.
period. So here we are. Uh, we've added another grandchild since then. Me and Cheryl and just were blessed beyond recognition. And uh, let me just say this. There are so many possibilities, so many opportunities for you out there. I hope you seize them. I hope when you look in the sea of faces in the classroom, you can see there's a need here. There's a need here. Let's nurture these folks. Let's bring them along. Let's teach them the right things. Let's be there to encourage. Let's be there to see the value. We have a lot of titles. There's principals, there's vice principals, there's, you know, in the business world, there's executive vice presidents, there's CFOs, there's CEOs. I mean, we all have titles. Uh, I'm a studio host. You know, I'm, I happen to be married to a world changer, and, and, and uh, I've written a book, so I'm an author. And I'm, but we can, you know what title I love? And this is the one, hey, if this is the end of day, if I, if this is the last time anybody sees me, here's, here's all you got to say. You know what he was? He was the, he was the vice president in charge of Blackberry Distribution. That would be fine. I love you all. I appreciate you. Have a great school. yourselves. You're going to be here till 4 o'clock. I wish I could be here for all the HR stuff. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to bounce, but thank you for your attention. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the kind applause. And, uh, and again, and thank you most of all for doing this, for following this path. You're the most important folks in the world, so thank you. And no. <laughs> Not everything, not everything has to be, not everything has to have a round of applause. It can just be a quiet one of the There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ernie. Uh, we, we did order some of his books to give out. Unfortunately, they got back ordered, and we will be drawing some names, so you may get uh, an autographed copy of his book, Unscripted. Uh, I read it a few months ago, and it is powerful. A lot of the stories that he shared with you today, but, you can see why we love Ernie. Uh, his, his daughter did it in all county schools at Davis uh, for a while before they made the transition.